next week also, next Saturday, is the uh, Classic Wheels on Main Street event. It's called the eighth annual. The seventh didn't happen because of COVID last year. So it's the eighth nonetheless. They block off South Avenue, a little bit of uh, East Avenue, and Main Street from eight in the morning till about four, 4.30. So if you're driving from the South, uh, you'll need to go down Hazen Street or something to get her. I mean, it's gonna be cars all over the place. And uh, we're allowed to set up our chili booth, so we're working on the plans for that, and, and, uh, uh, and several people have volunteered to be a part of that. It's a good fundraiser for us. But next week, just bear in mind, if you get here and there's 150 cars <laughs> and they're all classed, it's a beautiful event. If you like old cars, come and look around. It's really, really amazing. We are looking through uh, Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthians, as a guide or an instruction, a scripture that pertains to building community. We set our agenda, our purpose, our mission, our theme a little bit more than a year ago from a business model to a biblical model, which is building or to be a living community of Jesus Christ. And Corinthians addresses that in many different ways. Today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just a part of the section on what are called typically spiritual gifts, but I titled this message Spiritual Things. I don't like the word thing. Whenever someone in my family or within my environment refers to an object, an item, some kind of a contraption, a device as a thing, I say, that doesn't help me a bit. Don't use the word thing because it applies to every object out there. <laughs> Spiritual things. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. Now, by the way, what Paul has been doing is addressing a, a variety of issues from several sources in this letter. And he begins with a report that came from some family named Chloe and what they were doing ratting out their own church to the Apostle Paul about stuff going on. And then apparently they wrote him or sent a courier with a number of issues they didn't know how to solve in their own church. And so he says in a middle section now about the things that you wrote. And then he gets to this section. He goes, okay, now I got a couple other things I want to bring up. It's very interesting to read all the way through the letter. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, I have to say, I'm interrupting myself, the word gift is not in the Greek text. There is no reference to a gift in this passage. Well, we'll get to that. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Spiritual gifts is one of the most wonderful, delightful, amazing, precious promises from God the Father through Jesus Christ by means of the Holy Spirit to the community of Jesus. 
It's how we are able to function. And there is almost nothing more divisive, more caustic, more challenging, more difficult than talking about spiritual gifts across the body of Christ. It is absolutely astounding how such a delightful and wonderful and precious promise has become so divisive between the, the uh, branches of the church. When Paul begins this um, first section, he says, Now, concerning pneumaticone, it's a neuter word that means spiritual stuff. Let's talk about spirit, not the Holy Spirit personally, but spiritual stuff, spiritual things. Let's get into the spiritual realm. Let's talk about what it is that is evidence or distribution of the Spirit of God. The view that you hold about spiritual gifts is incredibly revealing of both your theology and your anthropology. That is, what do you believe about God and what do you believe about yourself? When I first became a Christian, it was suddenly. Not everybody has the same kind of experience that I have. It was not in a church service. It was not as a result of going to a camp meeting or being at a concert. There was no one else around. I had no lead in. I hadn't gone to church. I'd never been to a Sunday school class. I didn't own a Bible. I had my mother's Hebrew Bible from when she was a child growing up in synagogue and got confirmed. They gave her a Bible. She didn't know how to read it. It was just an old book on the shelf. It was kind of creaky when you open it up and the pages were pretty dried out. I had looked at it a couple of times. I didn't have any idea what it said. So I, and that's only the Old Testament, the, the covenant part. So I, I had that, but I had no, I mean, I looked at it and it meant absolutely nothing to me. So I had no context except I had watched my mother die. Something happened in that room to this day. I can't actually explain, except I know what my experience was. Something left the room. I would say theologically it was her soul leaving her body, but I'm not sure that that's really what happens. I don't know. But it caused me to be curious, not frightened. I wasn't alarmed by it. It wasn't something that distressed me or made me cry. My mother had shriveled from 140 or 50 pounds down to about 70. Her body was scarred and cut and lost parts. So in my 15-year-old mind, it was, it was a good thing for her to go, to end the pain, the, the constant trauma to her body. And I just had this sense, something just slipped out. It's a spiritual thing. Was that a gift? It's going to wrap up into this, let me tell you. It was a spiritual thing that happened. The problem for me was I had no language to talk about it. I, I, could, I could experience it, but I couldn't say what it was. It's like a child getting their first inoculation. There are six months old or a year old, and they get their first shot, and then they have no idea they're going to the doctor. They have no idea what's about to happen. They see the little device there. But they can't interpret that. And all of a sudden, the doctor goes, plink, into their arm, and their body says, whoa, an experience I can't explain. And they start screaming and crying. Some do. Other kids just go, what just happened? And they can't really talk about it. But then... Every sequential time you go into the doctor's office, like, I'm going to get a shot, and I don't want to get a shot, and I'm really scared, or nothing's really going to happen, and it really doesn't matter to me. It's very interesting, the experience. But something, something happens there, and, and you have to add language to it later to begin to interpret what's going on. Well, I had a friend in high school, a girl that I was dating, 
who was a very committed Christian girl. And after two years of struggling, wondering, questioning, trying to figure out, talking to adults, to my peers, to religious people, what did I experience? What happens after death? Everybody had an opinion, but nobody really seemed to know. My friend Karen said, the resurrection of Jesus is the only thing you have to really think through. If it didn't happen, nobody knows what happens after death. But if it did, then Jesus alone explains what you experienced. That was a question. That was pretty simple. Either what happened on Easter Sunday is true, or it's not. And for me as a 17-year-old, it boiled down to that. So instead of feeling guilty for sin or groveling before God or talking about how awful I was or whatever, I thought if the resurrection of Jesus actually happened, then I'm going to follow him because he's the only one that teaches there is true life and I'm the life and that's the proof. So I became a Christian on that basis. I didn't have a Bible. I didn't know any Bible verses. I got a good news for modern man at a youth breakfast, which is a paraphrase of the Bible. I started memorizing that. It's not necessarily a real good thing to do because I had to unlearn a whole bunch of verses in order to learn what they really said later on. But almost immediately after becoming a Christian and getting involved in this youth breakfast, people started talking about spiritual gifts. It was back in the early 1970s. And it was a raging issue across the church, really divide, dividing churches that had been stable and unified for decades, if not centuries, over the issue of speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues. God is a healer and miraculously heals or he doesn't. Um, God, God gives prophecies to certain people and they can announce what God has said or that doesn't really happen, and on and on. There's all these spiritual gift things. Probably the most significant one back in the early 70s was the issue of speaking in tongues. And people back then, still being taught, still an issue, if you don't speak in tongues the way they did in Acts chapter 2 and what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and some other place in the Bible, if you don't speak in a language you never learned humanly as a function of prayer, then you do not have the Holy Spirit. You are devoid of the Spirit. That's the marker. That is the way you know that you have the Holy Spirit. And so there were actually classes on how to speak in tongues that I was invited to come to so that I could get the gift of speaking in tongues and have the gift of the Holy Spirit. There were pamphlets. There were books. I still have a couple of them on my shelf. And the idea was this one singular gift was the key to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it split churches. It was amazing how people on both sides of that singular issue looked with arrogance and, and derision at the other side on the same issue. The charismatic movement said everybody in the church that doesn't speak in tongues is dead. Dead as a doornail. They don't have the Holy Spirit. God is not working you no matter what you're doing. I don't care what other Bible verses you've ever found. It has nothing to do with the real Holy Spirit. And the people who are not tongue speakers said, you people have lost your minds. There's a Bible verse that says if, you, if you're just speaking into the air, people will say you're crazy, and they did. And so the church became incredibly divided over spiritual things. Over and over and over, people come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14 on the issue of spiritual gifts. What I found was that the way in which people basically dealt with spiritual gifts was also how they dealt with power and the desire to control what was going on in their lives 
in the lives of others, in the lives of the church. As Paul deals with this issue among the Corinthian people, his objective, I'm going to say from the very beginning, is to help them form a community of Jesus Christ with all of our differences, with tremendous variety, people who are extremely mature, deeply rooted, understand Old Testament, New Testament, all of the various factors that go into the Bible, into history, into very, very deep and mature. And those who are shallow, those who don't have a strong commitment, those who are skilled, those who are not skilled, all of that is in the community of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that Paul struggles through this entire letter, from the very beginning to the very end, actually into 2 Corinthians as well, is that if we are a community of Jesus Christ, then how we view each other and how we treat each other matters. The strong to the weak, the educated to the ignorant, the old to the young, the novice to the mature, it really does matter how we treat each other. Oh, I was uh, utterly amazed. I didn't have a church background. I didn't have a theological stance. The division that I saw that happened over spiritual gifts. One of the things I found is that there was a presumption, and I was taught this. I was taught this specifically. God treats believers in a totally different way than he deals with everybody else in the world. The treatment by spiritual gifts is to equip a believer for a supernatural ministry that they could not, would not, and never would be able to develop aside from having a spiritual gift. That's it. God specifically equips believers. So the procedure that I was taught from the very beginning is get saved you have a relationship with Jesus. And then, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will have a second experience of a filling of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then you will have a relationship with the whole God and not just two-thirds of the God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the way I was taught it. Then, God only works in the saved, spiritually filled people. He doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. Everything else in the world, every teaching, every knowledge, every ability, everything else in the world is from the devil or from the natural realm. And only God works through believers. That's what I was taught. Or a second option was God actually equips every human being because he is God of all of humanity. It was amazing to me when I finally became equipped to study Greek. And I've worked really hard at that. You know that I have. The text does not indicate in any way that spiritual giftedness or spiritual things are restricted only to Christian people that God is actually the God of every tribe, nation, language, people, over all. So the question then is, if someone has a sense of knowledge or a special skill or administrative understanding or some way of being able to do helps, did they come up with that on their own? Is the ability to learn and to know and to teach specifically only for Christians? What I found is that the idea, when I was a young Christian, very impressionable, that people who wanted control of other people's lives and walks in Christ developed an understanding that spiritual gifts was only for the Christian. When I was a college student at Roberts Wesleyan years and years ago, some of the college students were very oriented towards the charismatic movement. Others were not. And there was a young guy, I still remember his name, and I'm not going to say it because I don't want to go out on the Internet, but I remember his name. And 
he had a, what he called, a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit's spiritual gifts, one of the things that's listed here. And the word of knowledge was that day he was going to meet the woman that he was going to marry. That was the word of knowledge. It was a prophecy through a word of knowledge. So he was playing in some fall leaves. He was a junior my year in college, and a freshman girl was also playing in the leaves, and they both popped up through the pile of leaves together, and the first words out of his mouth were, God has revealed to me, you're going to be my wife. Because of a word of knowledge. And she believed it. And they got married. And about two years later, they got divorced. Because they were so mismatched to each other. But those of us who were in the religion philosophy department came into this incredible debate. If God gives a word of knowledge, how could he be wrong? Or did he intend for you to go through this pain? And it left us with huge questions about what does God do? Does, can God give counsel and advice through someone who is not a Christian, but the counsel and advice is godly and sound. And the ultimate question is, what's your view of God? Is he God only of the Christians, or is he actually God of humanity? And every good gift that he gives, James 1.17 says, every good gift is from the Father above. And one of the things Jesus says about the godly people and the ungodly people, as Bruce mentioned earlier, the sun shines on everyone's crops. The rain falls equally on believers' crops and unbelievers' crops. God is gracious, generous, kind, empowering, investing in humanity. It's the relationship we have with him and the community of Jesus that we are building that is the difference between saved and unsaved people, not their giftedness. But from the text, it is impossible to distinguish gifts or spiritual things only happen for Christians and not for everybody else. So the second major issue then is, what do you actually believe the church is? What happens when people come into relationship with Jesus by faith and have their sins forgiven? What actually is occurring in the life of the community of Jesus Christ. In the early 70s, and I've studied this extensively, for about the last 400 years, there has been a move in Christian theology towards individualism. The redefinition of almost everything Scripture says from us to me. And the change in spiritual gifts has to do with creating an experience about my life, my power, my ability to act for God, whether what I do is blessed, spiritually authentic, whatever it happens to be. And so the movement of history in the church, and particularly in the American church, has been a gospel that is in essence narcissistic. I look at my life. I stare at myself. I imagine, am I okay today? Do I, how am I doing? What was my impact? What is my ministry? What am I able to... And everything is about just me. It's a very amazing phenomenon. But the other side of that same question is, the church, the community, is really us. It is our experience that the Holy Spirit is the interaction between, among, and within all of us. It's actually what the scripture says. But when Paul begins to address the question of spiritual gifts, he says as his summary, chapter 12, verse 7, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The word for common good 
is a fascinating Greek word, sumphron. And it means the actual benefit that is paid out is common, not individual. It's clearly stated the first readers of this in the original language would have easily understood a spiritual thing is not about what good does it do me. What do I get out of it? How am I authenticated? Does this prove that I have the Holy Spirit? Is this an evidence of my relationship with God? It is about sumphron, a common good, creating community. As a matter of fact, Paul goes on throughout this entire passage and throughout chapter 13 and throughout chapter 14. They didn't divide it into chapters. It was all one context. It comes back to this key verse. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given for the sumphron. And then the sumphron, the common good, the benefit to all of us, is explained in the remainder of these chapters, in the remainder of chapter 13 and 14. But ultimately, this issue comes down to who you think you are. You know and I know, people stay at churches because they're getting something out of it. And they leave churches because they're not getting something out of it. The entire factor about what engages has to do with personal benefit, the payoff to me. In chapter 7, uh, in uh, chapter 12, verses 7 through 11, Paul writes, To each one the manifestation of the Spirit, the evidence, the, the clear revealing of the Spirit, is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and same spirit. Paul specifically avoids the individual. The focus all the way through is God has one spirit and he brings benefit to all of us. He distributes them to each one as he determines. And then he goes into a very long passage about how the body works. He says you have one body, fingers, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. They're all different functioning. God designed that. He's the one who did that all across the body. And he makes it work together as long as the body is willing to be a community. At the very end, he says, I want you to build in your life a desire for the common good, what all of us get together. At the end of that passage, he says, I don't want there to be, there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one is honored, every part is honored. That is community. So instead of having the benefit, the nature of spiritual things, spiritual gifts, spiritual requirements, spiritual empowerment, spiritual uh, evidence, the work of God in us is not what do I get from it, but what do I contribute to the good of the community, to the body as a whole. Paul's stress throughout this entire Section. In fact, this entire letter, in fact, both letters to the Corinthians, and in fact, almost everything that Paul wrote is that together, God is mightily at work in us, through us, among us, in between us. That's why we designed that logo with the various spots and all the lines going this way and that way, and God is around all of it. So that the nature of spiritual gifts, true spiritual gifts, is never to divide, to split, to create haves and have-nots, to have those that are empowered and those that are disempowered. 
but to actually create a bond of unity so powerful, nothing can divide it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it is so amazing what we have done to ourselves in the church. The very things that should bind us together split us apart. One person has one gift and another a different gift. And rather than rejoice in what is either visible or invisible, what is predominant or what is subtle, instead of rejoicing about that, we're jealous. Instead of celebrating you and what your Holy Spirit does among us, we criticize and argue. The spiritual things that Paul is talking about, the actual evidence of your Holy Spirit at work is the community of Jesus. That we're genuine with each other. When we have a need, we confess it and someone will meet it. When we have a strength or an ability, we offer it and someone will use it. And both the user and the one receiving bless you. Because you are the one who has provided. Create in us the community of Jesus. We pray in his name. Humble yourselves.